So we are so excited. Um, the the Alliance and QCASA, our Queer Caucus Against Sexual Assault, are so excited to have some folks from Anchor Health here with us today uh, to share their expertise. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Anchor Health in case folks are not super familiar, but I wanted to just take a second to acknowledge the life-saving work that folks at Anchor are doing every single day by providing gender and life-affirming health care to people here in Connecticut. Uh, I know I, I feel very privileged to live in a state where we have access to this kind of health care. Um, we know that's not true everywhere for all people. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from Dr. Ecker and Dr. Canary today. So Anchor Health is Connecticut's leading health center focused on embracing and promoting the health and well-being of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and gender non-conforming individuals through compassionate, comprehensive, and evidence-based care in a safe, welcoming, and affirming space. It was established in 2016 and now sees more than 2,500 patients across two full-service clinics and over 50% of patients are trans and gender nonconforming. Anchor Health Services include primary and preventative care, gender and life affirming medicine, HIV prevention and treatment, comprehensive STI testing, behavioral health care, and more. And in short, they are health care for queer people by queer people. So our two panelists from Anchor Health today are Dr. AJ Ecker and Dr. Joseph Canary. Dr. Ecker is the Medical Director of Anchor Health's Gender and Life Affirming Medicine, or GLAM, program. Dr. Ecker is Connecticut's first out non-binary trans doctor. They are board certified in family medicine and established the GLAM program in 2020. As a non-binary and trans medical provider with over 15 years experience, Dr. Ecker created GLAM to empower trans and gender non-conforming people in their gender journeys. Additionally, he's an assistant clinical professor of family medicine at the Frank H. Netter MD School of Medicine at Quinnipiac University and piloted a fourth year medical student rotation at Anchor Health. Dr. Eckert has been published several times in science-based medicine, a group blog exploring issues and controversies in the relationship between science and medicine. And they were on the 2021 abstract review committee for the United States Professional, professional Association for Transgender Health. Dr. Joseph Canary uh, is Anchor Health's HIV Prevention and uh, the Medical Director of Anchor Health's HIV Prevention and Treatment Program. Dr. Canary earned degrees from Arizona State University and the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth and completed his combined internal medicine and pediatrics residency at Yale New Haven Hospital, during which he studied Anchor Health's co-founder, Dr. A.C. Demidon. Dr. Canary officially joined Anchor Health in August of 2020. He's board certified in internal medicine and pediatrics and provides comprehensive primary and, in, and preventative care to his patients, including gender affirming medicine, HIV prevention and care, hepatitis C treatment and more. He's a clinical instructor in pediatrics at the Yale School of Medicine. And Dr. Canary and the team at Anchor are sub investigators in a phase three clinical trial for long acting injectable medication for HIV prevention and PrEP. The medication lasts a full six months and would dramatically improve the available PrEP options if this is approved. And our third panelist today is Bridget Kessner from the Alliance. Um, I'm really excited to hear Bridget talk more about sort of some of the policy implications of consent and, and some of the things we're going to be talking about today. Bridget Kessner is the policy manager with the Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence. She's been dedicated to anti-sexual violence work for the last decade. She has experience in a variety of capacities, including direct services, training and technical assistance, and public policy. Her work has allowed her to see gaps in the system and various challenges survivors face, which inspired Bridget to make change through public policy work. She's also the facilitator for QCASA, the Queer Caucus Against Sexual Assault, which is also part of putting on this panel today. QCASA is a network of survivor advocates who identify as LGBTQ plus and use their identities and experiences to build community and bolster advocacy for survivors of sexual violence who identify as LGBTQ. There are very impressive panelists for today. Um, we're gonna just jump into conversation in a second. I wanted to just share one piece of logistics for you all 
which is that if we have time near the end of today's panel, um, we'll invite some audience questions. We're going to just use the chat for that today. So feel free throughout the panel discussion if you have a question to put it in the chat. And then if we have some time at the end, uh, we'll read a few of those and, and open them up to the panel. Okay, so my first question um, for for anybody on the panel who would like to answer is why are consent and bodily autonomy so important for service providers specifically working with queer people? Um, and if you if you folks, especially from anchor, if you want to speak about, I said queer, but you know, if you want to speak about any specific populations more specific than that, feel free to to do that as well. Why is this so important? I guess I'll kick it off. Um, I think that uh, without those pieces and in general, um, uh, without a lack of access to culturally appropriate and safe space, uh, trauma-informed care, uh, it causes an avoidance of care, a mistrust of healthcare professionals and not following recommended treatments. And um, in addition to like the perceived and experienced stigma, especially marginalized, historically marginalized populations such as queer people experience. So. Uh, for us, especially like consent and bodily autonomy, which is uh, part of the models of safe space and trauma informed care are incredibly important. And so like a consent based approach takes into account things like minority stress theory, um, history of exposure to harmful practices, uh, including the ones that happen commonly in healthcare settings, uh, things like bodily discomfort and dysphoria, trauma and patient safety are all like very, very important to consider when working with queer people. Thanks, Dr. Eckert. Um, I wonder, and, and this is maybe me not knowing a ton about Anchor, um, do you all work with, with younger people as well? Um, I don't know if that, do you have like some population of folks that are maybe under 18? And, and could you speak a little about maybe how does consent, uh, how, why it's also important for youth? Yeah, we have patients who are, we take um, primary care patients as young as 12 and then if we're doing uh, gender affirming care, anybody who has started puberty, so basically anybody who started puberty and we're using puberty blocker treatment with, I think our youngest patient might be 10 at this point. So uh, definitely we see um, people under 18 as well. As far as um, I, maybe Dr. Canary can speak a little bit more as a pediatrician as well to kind of inform consent and consent based practices with our pediatric patients. Yeah, I think like a recent um, anecdote comes to mind actually of a child I took care of, I think who was 13 who came in for gender affirming care, um, just described like being examined while crying um, in a very invasive way by their pediatrician. And just the idea that that is still happening is so, is so mind blowing to me. Um, and I think this is unfortunately a lot of people show up to us, like Dr. Ecker was saying, already traumatized by the medical community. Um, and so I think trying to, that's why I'm so passionate about working with pediatric trainees is um, trying to instill this idea of like, you know, we really should be asking consent um, before touching anyone anywhere in an exam. Um, and, and that includes children. And I think that's kind of like a novel idea. Um, and so, uh, definitely something that's like informed a lot of my practice and teaching um, and it is still really needed because it's still continuing to happen. Yeah, and a lot of our patients, uh, like Dr. Canary just said, uh, really have had really bad experiences with healthcare in the past. So things like being treated disrespectfully by healthcare staff, uh, being turned away from providers just because of their perceived or actual gender identity or uh, sexual orientation. Uh, you know, being denied services, uh, being harassed, being humiliated, intentional misgendering, uh, intentional dead naming, uh, using abusive language, having unwanted physical contact. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, we hear it pretty regularly from our patients. I don't know that we have many who haven't had at least one bad experience with a healthcare provider, and that's incredibly unfortunate. So we really do work hard to make our space as um, 
as comfortable and safe and um, as trauma informed as we can so that we're not uh, we're, we're working with our patients to actively avoid any kind of uh, re-traumatizing behaviors. Yeah, I imagine it's a lot of sort of rebuilding trust for people with the medical system, or at least with your your practice, right? Um, and because we know there's there's real there's health consequences for people for you know not feeling safe to go to the doctor and not getting the treatment that they need. Um, could you? Also, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say like one way that we try to do that is um, we very rarely as a point like don't do physical exams on the first visit almost ever unless someone has something very urgent that they want us to look at but um the first visit is just talking and that and I, we try to say that up front to kind of put people at ease um to explain you know because sometimes people's hearts are racing like just waiting to okay when's the part when now there's gonna be this exam and i might feel uncomfortable and so trying to just like take that off the table for the first visit and then negotiating and agreeing on any exams that happen in the future before they begin. That's sort of answers my my next question for you all, but that maybe there's other things you all can speak to. Um, yeah, what are what are some of the the practices or the things you're actually doing in your work or or policies that you all have as as a healthcare organization um, to really reinforce these ideas of consent and bodily autonomy for folks? Yeah, so um, part of it is asking permission before we touch anybody, making sure that uh, our patients understand that they are in complete uh, charge and autonomy of their body is important to us. So making sure that uh, any procedure or anything that we're planning to do with them, that they understand why and why it would be important and that they understand that this is a recommendation, but if there's a particular reason that they do not want to do something, I'm not going to be somebody that's forcing them to do an exam that is potentially traumatic. Um, that's, you know, I, as a doctor, I'm gonna say this is a recommendation. And this is the reason that I'm gonna say is important to do it, but I understand if this is going to be something that's traumatic, these are the re these, these are some of the ways we could potentially work on getting you there, or these are some of the alternatives we have to this, but I'm never going to force someone to do something that is going to cause them more trauma. Um, we try to really pay attention to people's you know, bodily cues, uh, whether or not we're making them comfortable, um, being mindful about the language we're using, making sure we're mirroring our patient's language, uh, trying to stick with, as much gender neutral language as possible or, or reflecting whatever our patients are using, um, asking our patients the terminology that they use for their body parts. And uh, obviously things like making sure we're using the correct names and pronouns and that, that goes from the minute they step through the door, right? So making sure that our environment from the moment the patient comes in, I mean, even before, even before our patients come, come in, uh, the moment they, look us up on the website or call us or fill out the patient forms, register, come into the door, that they feel like they're being seen and they feel like they're being heard and they're, they feel like they're having an experience where we're actually listening to them and paying attention. Mm -hmm. I think the patient forms is like an important piece, like um, which, which Dr. Eckert and Michael really worked very, very hard to redo recently. And, um, I always make a point of teaching that to any like students or residents that rotate with us, like look at our form. This is how it should be so that, you know, name, sex assigned at birth, gender identity, all that stuff is captured, you know, pronouns are all captured like right at the beginning so that the whole team from check-in and, but sometimes the trauma begins with the phone call or the front desk interaction um, where there's dead naming and all that stuff going on. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of um, providing trauma informed gender affirming like interactions and care for people is so much of it does just show up in like our some of the kind of boring stuff that we have to do right like what does our paperwork look like. Um, what are our, what are our policies when somebody walks in the door or calls our office and and how are we handling the way we're greeting people and things like that like it's nothing super dramatic but but communicates immediately to someone if this is going to be a safe, comfortable experience for them or not. Um, I wonder if we could, and, and Bridget, please feel free to jump in on this one too, if we could talk a little bit about 
some of the barriers that queer people face in, in seeking medical care. Um, we certainly want to think about queer survivors as well and some of the barriers that folks seek when they're maybe seeking care following an experience of sexual violence. Um, well, yeah, what are some of the things that, that our folks are dealing with? Yeah, I'm happy to um, jump in and start and speak to some of that, um, you know, in regards to sexual assault. Um, we know that LGBTQ plus folks experience sexual violence disproportionately, um, but they do remain underserved um, by rape crisis services. Um, and there are really a significant number of barriers that survivors could really face, but I'll just speak to a few that um, sort of fall under this question best. Um, I think one thing is that uh, some of the institutions that survivors are often advised um, or expected to turn to have traditionally done harm within the LGBTQ plus community um, and individuals that they may know. Um, this can include law enforcement, um, hospitals. So we want to ensure that um, there are alternatives, right? And that people understand what their options look like. For instance, with evidence uh, collection kits, often referred to as rape kits, um, those are elective procedures. Um, they don't require somebody to report to the police if they want to go through one. Um, and medical care can occur independently of that process, which is really, really critical um, because that's an important step for many folks, depending on the dynamics of the sexual assault they experienced. So finding a safe place for them to go for that medical service, uh, first and foremost, can make a significant difference. And understanding the evidence collection uh, process and sort of what that looks like. Um, I think it's really important in those cases for all services to provide transparency in regards to their associations with and obligations uh, to various institutions, right? So are they mandated reporters? What do they have to report? Um, what does their confidentiality policy look like? Um, how much of a particular process would be left up to the survivor's choice? So that sort of um, you know relationship with institutions is one thing. Um, I think traditional narratives and gender expectations around sexual assault can be harmful for survivors who might not fit into that mold. Um, this can keep them from accessing services because it may be harder for them to identify that they're a survivor, may make them feel as if they won't be believed. Um, so we want to ensure that we're always providing adequate representation in our community education and outreach of different um, genders and um, individuals who can experience sexual violence, because this is something anybody can experience, right? Um, and we need to ensure that services are always um, believing and validating people, um, you know, and the dynamics of the incident to the same extent, um, no matter what the genders of, of the individuals who are involved. Um, so those are just a few um, ideas that come to the top of my head. Um, with this, uh, and I think lastly as well, if they experience uh, violence within their community, right, um, it may make them concerned that they'll be stigmatizing their community if they come forward, they may be um, isolated if they come forward, so we're always, as with anything else, going to take their lead and respect their autonomy um, in the decisions that they make. Um, they are going to be expert in their own life and in their own choices. Um, and we also want to ensure that we're respecting their privacy through their disclosure process. Thanks, Bridget. And I think, you know, and, and Dr. Eckert, you were talking about this sort of, I think the, the first question that I asked just about some of the things that you've heard from patients about having really negative experiences um, seeking medical care. And so, of course, those things are going to be true regard, you know, especially for somebody maybe in like a heightened moment of trauma, they're seeking care for for an experience of sexual violence, but but already have had really harmful experiences at the hospital or at their primary care or wherever they were, um, you know, that that's gonna just play out for folks again. So it makes me super appreciative of all of the things you all are doing to, to challenge some of those um, traditionally really binary and, and potentially harmful things that folks have experienced. Bridget, I wanted, oh, sorry, go ahead. The barrier Bridget brought up about like the emergency room particularly, um, that is such a tough place, uh, I think, you know, for everyone. But, um, and I know people that work in the emergency room are like 
really overstretched and especially in the era of COVID, like burnt out beyond the crisp. Um, so no disrespect to their work, but it's really not usually the most welcoming place to our community. Um, and so like a recent patient comes to mind who um, was hoping to have evidence collection done um, or to have a, at least to have a crisis representative come to clinic um, but the crisis response in our area won't come to the clinic, but only come to the emergency room. So the only way to get access to that level of in-person support was um, for him to go to the emergency room, and he was not at all comfortable doing that. And then um, also, you know, the collection kit, you know, we're unable to do that in the outpatient setting. Usually that has to be done in the emergency room. Um, and so, you know, that's a huge barrier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it makes me think about some of the, this is, you know, we start to think about policy and like, what are, what are the laws in our state that are, you know, that's why, that's why I'm, I mean, I'm assuming that's why somebody has to go to the emergency room if they want to have a forensic exam done. Um, that's why our crisis teams respond to emergency rooms and not to clinics and to, to other spaces. Um, so, so my next question was really to, to ask sort of from a policy lens, like what are some examples um, of things in our, in our own state um, of policies that, that support trauma-informed medical services for survivors and for queer people? Um, I know Bridget can speak to, in particular, the last legislative session and some of the wins that we had there. Um, but now I'm also thinking a little bit about like, what are, you know, what are some of the changes that we would like to see maybe legislatively to, to make care more accessible to people? Yeah, definitely. I could start off, um, especially as, as you had said, speaking about the last legislative session. Um, I think first and foremost, what comes to mind is the uh, intimate exam bill that had been passed. Um, that was something that we were pushing for at the Alliance and with some community partners for the last few years. Um, this ensures that patients who are under anesthesia while they're at a teaching hospital um, must have previously consented in a writing specifically to a uh, pelvic or prostate exam if one is to occur while they're under anesthesia for uh, learning purposes. Um, surprisingly, this actually wasn't the case before the bill's passage. And so as part of sort of a general consent form, they could sign off. That sort of exam could be um, conducted while they were under anesthesia, regardless of what they were sort of in the hospital for um, so that folks could learn how to perform those exams. Um, and so, of course, ensuring that consent is given in those situations and that, you know, as advocates, we talk about consent being specific to a certain action, right? Um, and so uh, now patients are able to specifically um, consent to this particular type of exam occurring um, while they are incapacitated, right, by the uh, sleep and anesthesia. Um, so that was a major, major win. Um, I think it's also important to acknowledge the abortion access legislation that we had this session. Um, more providers are able to conduct, um, you know, abortion care, um, you know, specifically APRNs who are trained in uh, providing that sort of care. Um, but we're not able to under state statutes that, you know, stated it had to be a physician uh, previously perform abortions. Um, and then uh, individuals who come in from out of state are protected. Um, so um, if their home state essentially attempts to investigate, uh, folks in Connecticut wouldn't be able to give that information, again, respecting their autonomy to get that sort of care in a different place. Um, additionally, language around abortion was made um, gender neutral. Um, when they were already, um, you know, essentially creating this legislation, they were able to, um, you know, reopen previous legislation around abortion and make those changes to ensure that it reflects how reproductive care actually plays out um, for people of various genders. Um, obviously, this is critically important because abortion uh, is a service that some survivors need, depending on the dynamics of what happened. Um, it's also an issue of autonomy. And as, as you said, um, you know, Kelsey, um, both of these issues are uh, issues of autonomy and uh, making choices about our own bodies, which is a core tenant of the anti-sexual violence movement too. Um, we also worked on a consent bill and while it didn't pass, we were able to have meaningful conversations about social norms and legal principles around consent. 
Um, Connecticut does not have a uh, consent defined in statute. So we were attempting to create a statute that would define consent um, because unfortunately a lack of a definition leads to ambiguity, a lot of inequity as to how that's applied. Um, so it'll be interesting following those conversations to see um, how this plays out in the future um, at the legislature as well as um, you know within our field. Yeah, it's it's interesting thinking about um, some of the you know we've we've been talking obviously at the alliance a lot about the the consent bill and and hopes you know hopes from this maybe passing in the future um, and conversations that you all are having with legislators now um, and I I had not thought about I think I'm I'm appreciative that Dr. Canary brought up like the the issue specifically around emergency room care being really limiting for a lot of folks. Um, certainly folks from the queer community, but you know, many, many people don't wanna to go to the emergency room for a lot of reasons. Um, and thinking about like, where can we do forensic exams and, and where can we have folks respond to? It's like a whole other legislative uh, thing that I'm thinking of. So I'm sure we'll talk about that more <laughs> over at the Alliance. Um, Bridget, I'm glad, I'm really glad that you brought up um, abortion and reproductive access rights and, and access. Um, because I would love if folks could talk a little bit about how the attack on folks' reproductive rights is also an attack on the queer community, the trans community. Um, yeah, anything anybody wants to share on that? Yeah, so so one of the things is that um, many of the, uh, a lot of abortion services happen at Planned Parenthood clinics and Planned Parenthood clinics are also where a lot of people end up getting their hormones and their gender affirming services. And so that directly impacts, you know, people being able to access those services. Uh, in addition to that, you know, a lot, of, a lot of this is going to impact states in the South, which is where a lot of uh, trans people live. And so, I mean, that's directly going to impact their ability to access uh, gender affirming care. Additionally, you know, there are many trans people who can and will get pregnant and they already have enough difficulty accessing uh, care and abortion care specifically. So that's just going to make it more difficult. And they're already among the most vulnerable in the population of people trying to access, um, you know, abortion clinics and just like any kind of um, pregnancy, you know, or abortion related care. Uh, so yeah, having the highest population of like, trans people living, um, you know, in the South where there's the more most stringent bans uh, certainly puts us like in the most vulnerable position. So it is very kind of closely linked that way. Uh, additionally, you know, having trans people be the ones most uh, likely to struggle with additional issues such as like poverty and job discrimination adds that layer to it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we were already seeing folks really not having full reproductive right, like access to full reproductive rights, like before Roe was overturned, um, potentially based on geography, but also as you're saying, Dr. Eckert, like we know there's so many overlapping issues for folks around economics and discrimination and, and stuff like that, that are folks were already really didn't have full access to the care that they need. Um, and so now, of course, it's even it's that much harder. Yeah, and then, you know, if if there's also the fear for a lot of transmasculine people who do not want to get pregnant and may be forced to carry a pregnancy, right? So then having that difficulty to access care that is so, they so desperately need in those situations where it's going to cause like very severe, you know, mental harm as well. Like, I just, I can't even imagine. I mean, it's just, that's, it's incredibly harmful. I mean, it's already incredibly harmful, but I, I think like for our community, it, it obviously just very directly impacts us, yes. Yeah, I think something else that sort of comes to mind with this is the way all of this is intertwined and linked um, to each other in terms of people feeling their agency being challenged, whether it be through sexual violence. Um, of course, again, LGBTQ plus folks are at much higher um, uh, disproportionate rate of experiencing that sort of violence. Um, and then you have, um, you know, as a community, um, we also 
have not always and often do not have the same agency um, that, you know, uh, other folks are um, when they're, you know, cisgender heterosexual individuals, right, their right to be married, receive the kind of medical care that they need, things of this nature did not need to be legislated in order to happen and aren't a matter of conversation at in the legislature, right? Um, so I think the way that humans feel when their agency is being challenged can be so triggering to all of the ways that their agency has been challenged and is actively being challenged. Um, so I think when we consider people's um, general wellness, the uh, re-traumatization they might be experiencing, um, I think what's going on right now can be a really significant callback um, to the lack of autonomy, you know, LGBTQ plus people face within um, their identity or the way that they might have experienced it through sexual violence. Um, so I think that's something that's important that we're all cognizant of as we provide um, services and care to folks who have, um, you know, been in those positions. And I think in some in some spaces, you know, we've obviously we've been talking about um, for a few months now the Roe being overturned and and or or the when the leak came out, we knew it was going to be overturned. Like we've been having this conversation about um, reproductive rights for a while, and I and I still feel like in many spaces it's so focused on on cis women as, as like, like just the language that folks are using to talk about like who needs this care and who is this about and everything like it's we're still in a in a lot of ways not really getting it right like not being inclusive in our language um and well you know language is 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 just one part of what's happening like it, it matters to folks is that if they they feel welcome to be a part of this fight or feel like people are looking out for them or not I wonder if if anyone um, on our panel, you thinking about. So I know our our audience of folks here today are is I think we've got folks coming from a lot of different places. I know I see a lot of um, folks working for our rape crisis centers and anti sexual violence agencies around the state that are here today. But I know we have folks coming from other fields as well. Um, if there's if there's anything that you would want to charge our audience to to do you know if, they, if folks are sitting here today and they're and they're feeling inspired or they're feeling angry or they're feeling worried or or whatever it might be um what are things that that you think people could walk away from here today and and do whether that's things in their in their families in their homes in their communities or or on a legislative level or in their workplace like what can what can folks do leaving today I mean, I'm happy to start, um, you know, and get on my policy soapbox again. Um, but I think uh, it's important to stay informed and engaged. Um, you know, while legislation is in everything, and there are a lot of other, um, you know, important types of activism um, going on. Um, you know, it's something that's, you know, inevitably impactful. Um, and I think it's important that we all keep an ear out for state and federal policies that will impact survivors and LGBTQ plus folks. Um, and advocate for or against those policies the ways that we can, um, depending on their potential impact, um, right? In a lot of ways, we've come a long way with legislation, especially in Connecticut, but also there's been a significant wave of um, anti-LGBTQ sentiment and politics and policies that we're seeing rolled out, um, especially against, you know, uh, trans folks in the last couple of years. Um, and so it's important that we see how we can get involved, um, how we can communicate with our legislators, um, you know, ways that we can communicate um, the needs of our um, communities and, and others' communities. Um, you know, I think something that's coming to mind immediately is something that I've been really um, invested in uh, are the Title IX regulations that um, were just proposed by the Biden administration. Um, the uh, previous administration had put out Title IX regulations that were very restrictive and did not um, provide protection for, um, you know, trans kids, trans youth, 
Um, and the new regulations um, would include uh, discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity as things that institutions would need to be protecting students from in K through 12 and higher ed spaces. Um, so that's something that the public has a right to comment on. It's something that I think is important for people to understand if they work with youth um, or around youth, um, because it's going to have a very significant impact. And um, there are a lot of people that still don't want this to happen, right? They don't want, um, unfortunately, this youth to have this support and protection. So we need to ensure that we're speaking up um, to, to make sure that this, um, you know, is, is, uh, continues to be published as it was proposed. Yeah, I completely agree with Bridget Cosign, all of those things. <laughs> I guess I can just speak to like things that people can, who are providers can do, you know, potentially, um, in their spaces. Uh, so, you know, trying to create as kind of a therapeutic safe space as possible for patients. So a space where they can feel, you know, respected and uh, welcomed and affirmed, um, recognizing the prevalence of trauma in patients' lives and, you know, understanding ways to mitigate that as much as possible. And then practicing, you know, cultural humility, sensitivity, awareness as much as possible, understanding that we can't necessarily, uh, you know, be competent in someone else's uh, culture or someone else's experience, but we can uh, be empathetic and and we can, you know, have an approach to be open and understanding and to listen. I think too, yeah. just some of the like practical things we've been, um, and sort of side chatting here with Sarah a little bit about just like things that the Stanford area might be able to do. And I think that's awesome. Um, but uh, yeah, just thinking about like um, having advocates maybe specifically from the community uh, and that being an option that we could offer patients in the same way, like Sarah was saying, um, we have you know advocates who are Spanish speaking. Well, maybe we also have advocates who are specifically like members of the LGBTQ community and um, you know maybe offering that as someone to meet someone at the emergency room might be enough of an additional safety to kind of feel like they could go get that exam done. Um, and I think just thinking creatively about things like that, about the whole process of accessing care and where we can make it more comfortable um, would be would be great. I, I'm, I'm thinking too through like the, um, I think there's a standardized form from the state that um, like evidence collection form that's filled out, um, usually like handwritten by a SANE provider or nurse. Um, and I don't think that is the most uh, gender inclusive form, if I recall the last time I saw it. So like revising that, um, trying to advocate for SANE um, nurses and providers to receive cultural humility training um, for like LGBTQ people and issues um, would be another one. Um, so I think there's everything from the White House to just a form change that could make the could make a big difference. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate your point, Dr. Canary, about um, having advocates from advocates who are representatives of a particular community or from different communities. Um, you know, and one one thing I think happens. I don't know how much we have a practice of this in Connecticut, but one thing I've heard from um, some folks out in California anyway, is that at least on the sort of on the sexual violence side of things, you know, thinking about like Bridget was talking about a lot of the barriers that folks in the queer community face to even just accessing, going to a rape crisis center, um, calling a hotline, like, you know, all of the reasons why these, these places might not feel warm and comfortable and welcoming to people. Um, and so the practice of having a sexual assault advocate be in a space that is specifically for the queer community, right? Like being in it. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about some of the places that we have in Connecticut, but, but, you know, Anchor Health is certainly one of them that is already a space that people are going to and feel, feel really comfortable in, um, and being able to provide some of those other resources for people in a space so that they don't have to come to us, right? They don't need to walk into a building they've never been to before or call a phone number where they're not they don't totally know what it's going to be like to call. Um, 
that's another, I know, I know that that's a practice in some other places. I don't think we do it a ton in Connecticut yet, but it would be great for us to be doing more. Yeah, I think something else that's important to remember for advocates that do show up to hospitals and, you know, in order to provide um, that support is that it is um, necessary really within the scope of their role to ensure that um, they're advocating for that person in regards to things, um, you know, like their, um, their gender identity um, and things of that nature. You know, I've been in positions where I've had to repeatedly correct folks out in the ER um, who were misgendering somebody that they were providing care for. Um, and uh, I think advocates um, need to remember that that's within their role as they advocate for a person as, as a whole person um, and that their advocacy goes beyond their survivorship. Um, and uh, that whether or not they advocate in that moment, you know, when they have the ability to, um, will make a potentially a significant difference um, in someone's experience. Um, so I think that's something that advocates definitely um, need to be prepared to do and always keep in mind. So the question I'm, I'm perhaps the most excited to ask all of you uh, today is, what does a liberated, just world for queer people and survivors of sexual violence, what does that look like to you? Such a big question. Um, <laughs> but I think feel free to, think, to like, talk about whatever you want. <laughs> I think to think like biggest picture, like a world without sexual violence, you know. And I think that as a pe like putting my PD hat on, um, you know, really working to educate kids in school at younger ages about um consent and about bodily autonomy and respect and healthy relationships and you know, evidence-based sex education at a, a developmentally appropriate ages is like that's where it starts and that's how we build the bedrock of a better world moving forward and and I think and then in pediatric and family practice and other medical context offices like where you know that may be the first time that a non-family member is like involved in a genital exam or something that that can be a really powerful moment to you know uh, model appropriate consent language and behavior um, and I think that's really powerful so I think this goes into you know education and pediatric primary care and family medicine to um, start laying the groundwork for this future in, in the younger ages. I got a message Dr. Canary from an audience member asking how much did I pay you to say that because that's a, so much of what you're saying is is exactly um I certainly exactly what what I believe in what I know all of our prevention educators around the state that are are mostly doing work with with children with kids in schools um and are are trying to exactly what you're saying like laying this foundation for um knowing consent practicing consent uh, being able to talk about boundaries and the healthy relationships and, and all of that. Um, so that's certainly the work that a lot of folks within the coalition are doing. Um, and, and I love that you also specifically highlighted uh, evidence-based sex education, because I know that's a real, that's a real challenge in a lot of places. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I can definitely jump in because I think I would echo a lot of those sentiments. Um, so I can just say that, um, you know, I think respect for one another is autonomy and that being um, a critical part of our society and something we can all do is so important. Sexual assault challenges the autonomy of, of a human so deeply. Someone's body is invaded and changed without their consent, as is their life narrative, and um, we need to end sexual violence, right? And to do that, I, I agree that prevention is key. Um, I, you know, of course, want to ensure that everybody has comprehensive, accessible um, care, uh, you know, mental health care, physical health care of their choice, um, including reproductive health care, including abortion. Um, I think um, everyone should have a choice in how they move forward on their healing journey, should they experience something traumatic. Um, 
I think we need to understand how all of the suppression is tied to each other and we cannot um, undo any of these um, you know, challenges um, or oppressions um, without addressing the others. So while we, um, you know, address, um, you know, homophobia, transphobia, um, victim blaming, rape culture, um, if we're not also addressing, you know, things like white supremacy, um, patriarchy, um, ableism, and all of these other oppressions that are tied in, um, you know, we'll, we'll never really reach that goal until we acknowledge that and um, do that work. Um, and legislation and statutes and policy aren't the end all be all, um, but where they're appropriate um, or necessary, they need to align with our understanding and our activism. Um, so for instance, the, um, the consent bill um, that I had talked about earlier, we want to move away from the archaic values that built our state sexual assault statute in the first place to reflect instead our current understanding of sexual assault as a trauma individuals incur when their agency is challenged in this particular way. Um, so I think um, ensuring that um, we're, we're really reevaluating why our legislation and policies are what they are um, and how they might need to be uh, changed is, is really critical. Thanks, Bridget. All right. Well, if anybody thinks of if I know this is a, this is a really big question, right? Imagining, but I but I think we often in the um, at least I know in the in the anti sexual violence movement, I, I don't think we often actually we talk you know we talk about ending sexual violence, right? Like that that's the goal. That's that's why we're all here. Those of us from from like that side of things, right? Um, but I think we we often don't spend a ton of time imagining like what does that world actually look like, um, and if we can, if we don't have a vision for a world with no sexual violence, then I think it's harder to figure out what are the steps to actually get there. Um, if we don't have a vision for a world where queer people have all of the healthcare that they need, that um, that that are we are also not experiencing violence. Um, that we get all the support that we need. Right? Then then we don't know what steps to take to get there. Um, so I would encourage all of us in in the audience as well to to think about this wherever you're coming from, whatever field you work in. Um, we, you know, what does a liberated world look like for all of us? No, I'm I'm honestly really glad that you asked that question, Kelsey, because I think right now the uh, world is is messy and oppressive and scary for so many folks, and I think it's hard to imagine that that uh, bright future while so many people feel like they're treading water, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think um, it's it's great to have an opportunity to reflect on what we're really working toward. So I would love to give folks in the audience a chance to ask some questions if you have had any over the last hour. Um, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll just kind of see what we get and go from there. And I'm loving the tiny bit of uh, organizing I see in the chat around wishing we had specifically an LGBTQ hotline. Um, this is a great place for us to be talking about that. That's wonderful. All right, so one question uh, we just got is, is how, how is it teaching medical students how to be LGBTQ humble or in, you know, how to be uh, culturally responsive and, and with it when it comes to working with LGBTQ patients? Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough question, uh, only because there's so many layers to it. It's actually something that's a really interesting topic to me. I'm starting uh, a research project around this question particularly. Part of it is that ever since I was in medical school, which now is way too long ago for me to want to think about, but uh, the curriculum really hasn't changed for as 
as far as how much LGBTQ education is in the curriculum. So it can be anywhere from nothing at all whatsoever as far as LGBTQ education to maybe an hour, potentially three hours, and it's all lumped together into one lecture throughout your four years of medical school. Barely anything that you get taught around LGBTQ health, and it's all just clumped together again. So, you know, it's it's just not enough. And it's separated out, you know, from, from any other discipline. So there's no kind of acknowledgement that maybe there should be a little more integration into, you know, the curriculum over the four years. So, uh, you know, how we try to approach that is aside from just lectures, we take on students now for rotations. We also have uh, first and second year preclinical students come through for a full year uh, mesh site rotation. Uh, and the project that I'm doing now is to show that students who do like a preclinical uh, site rotation for a year end up with a lot more uh, kind of cultural competency and knowledge than they would if they were just doing kind of like a focus either, you know, no lectures or just a one hour lecture, basically. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it takes a lot. I think that the current medical school curricula really do not do a good job and they haven't for the last, you know, ever, really. So I am really hoping that we can change that moving forward. And I am encouraged to see that more people are thinking about it and changing that and that we're starting to do this research. But uh, it's it's a that's a big question, and I think it's uh, it's going to take a lot of change. Well, my sister graduated from Quinnipiac Medical School, so I hope she behaved in your class. <laughs> I think it's key to have also like like the teaching that Dr. Ecker does, where it's like talking to the whole class and not just like self selecting. Like, it's great when we have, like, oftentimes we'll get, like, medical students or nurse practitioner students or residents who are members of the community that want to, like, spend a bunch of time with us. And, like, that's great. And they should have that opportunity. But it's, like, getting the the people that wouldn't self-select into these experiences. Um, that's important. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and that's the other difficult part when I was thinking about doing that for the study is especially at our clinic, we're so careful on, of who we select as medical students to come through because of our patients. You know, we're so careful who we expose our patients to that there's no way we're not gonna do people who we've carefully selected for the site. So yes, that's a huge factor, uh, like Dr. Kaderi just said, but yeah, if anybody thinks of a good way we can test that, great. <laughs> Well, we know there, I mean, generally there's just like lack of research on all things queer, right? Like, so So also the fact that you're, I appreciate that you're doing some research on this specifically um, and add, adding to the body of work around that because it's, yeah, that's part of, probably part of the reason why we don't totally know how to fix this is because we haven't really studied it. Um, we got another question in the chat um, for both the anti-sexual violence movement and the LGBTQ healthcare world. Um, where is there, where is funding lacking and where is there potentially new funding showing up, if at all? It's lacking everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I will um, jump in and I'm sure you'll be happy with this, Kelsey, but I think somewhere I would um, love for the anti-sexual violence movement to have more ability to um, have funds for and invest in as prevention, um, because that's really going to be our key to ending sexual violence. And um, it's a place where definitely more funding is needed. Um, but something I will say, you know, that is um, exciting about our funding and the way our agency operates is that um, we have really great communication with the advocates that are serving throughout the state and the information that they give us help to inform, um, you know, some of the directions that our funds take. Um, so that's one way that I think um, things are working well. Yeah, I would I would totally echo what Bridget just said that we uh, our our biggest um, gap in funding in the anti-sexual violence world is in prevention. Um, we don't we really don't get a ton of money to federally, state-wise, like where all the places the money comes from, it doesn't typically 
it's more about crisis services because obviously that's super necessary and 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 not funded well either um but that we certainly certainly need more funding for prevention if we are really trying to to get to the world that we're all dreaming of here we also got a, a comment in the chat just that um somebody saying that some of the comments you all have the experiences you've had with um, medical students and, and the curriculum for medical students, folks in the dental world are seeing the same thing. I wanna give a few more minutes in case folks have uh, any other questions. I see one coming in. I also, I'm gonna, um, before we leave today, I will plug all of the all of the ways that you could be in touch with anchor health and following their um their social media and the, the things that they're up to because they have a lot of great things going on um and i would invite dr eckert dr canary if there's anything else in terms of ways folks can support the work that you're doing at anchor health please feel free to tell us that as well um another question we got in the chat is how what how has your experience been um, with DCF um, when reporting abuse or neglect related to sexual orientation and or uh, gender identity non acceptance? I'm trying to think if I've ever, I don't think I've dealt with DCF with that type of a particular case. Um, I don't know, Dr. Eckert, if you have, but I don't have one that comes to mind. We we deal yeah. with them sort of like kids who are in care, who seek care with us. And I think it's a variable experience in terms of how well we're able to communicate with people at DCF in that situation, but I haven't had the experience of reporting a case specifically around issues of sexual orientation or gender identity non-acceptance. Yeah, I haven't either, which is great. So I don't think we've had any neglect cases. We have had a couple of situations where we've had people under DCF care and they've made it incredibly difficult for those, uh, those youth to access gender affirming care. It's taken months and months. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as far as abuse or neglect, um, I don't I don't have any personal experiences with DCF related to that. It's an interesting question, though, like how would they respond to, say, like, you know, a kid comes out and their parents refuse to acknowledge their gender identity. You know, I would certainly think that is abuse, uh, but I wonder how that would be interpreted by by DCF. Um, it's an interesting question. I think those, like, unfortunately, because of who we are, the patients that show up at our door sort of are self-selected parents who are at least some degree supportive um, to kind of come to a place like ours. So I think it's a good question for like general mm -hmm. practice places. What training guidance intervention is given to medical providers who state that they aren't quote, comfortable uh, providing certain kinds of medical care. Um, and some of the examples this person gave were abortions, gender affirming care, hormone therapy um, for moral or personal reasons. There is none. Uh, medical providers are fully in their rights to say that and completely get away with it. And those are the kind of patients that we see then. Like I have so many patients that I see who tell me, well, I told my PCP, my primary care provider, and they said I should come here because they don't know what to do with me. I mean, like there's just, or, uh, you know, I had a student the other day who told, who said to me, oh, I, I told the last doctor that I worked with that I was coming here. And she said, well, I don't see those kind of patients. Like, <laughs> it's just, it, I don't know. It hurts me every time. And I keep hearing it like over and over. There's just, it's that it's an area of medicine where doctors can still very comfortably say, I don't see those kind of patients. That's not my area of interest or comfort. And it's OK. Like people seem to be fine with that. And that's what I'm really hoping we can start getting away from and just start educating future doctors that, you know, this needs to be an integrated part of the curriculum. They need to be comfortable seeing LGBTQ patients. You know, it's, it's not OK that they're not. 
Yeah, like just yesterday, someone sent us a patient um, for rule out monkeypox. Um, they're like, well, we don't do, we don't do that here. It's literally a Q-tip that you rub across vigorously three times and put in a sterile cup. There's nothing to it. And everyone in the state is a provider who's licensed is getting these DPH emails about what monkeypox is and how to deal with it. And it's very clear instructions. It's not complicated. And it's just like, oh, well, that's like a gay thing. So like, we're not going to even open that email. Um, so yeah, I think I was really humbled by, I forget who exactly, Data Haven, I think, a year or two ago, put out a statewide needs assessment mm -hmm. the community, similar to like the National Center for Transgender Equity survey from like 2015. Um, and our rates of people reporting abuse or neglect at the hands of medical providers was basically no different than the country as a whole. And I think sometimes in Connecticut, we think, oh, this is the Northeast, we're like a blue state, things are better here. Um, but we have data to demonstrably say that the people in our community's experience is not that. Got one more question in the chat for you all. Um, does Anchor collaborate with other healthcare facilities serving LGBTQ clients, um, substance abuse, mental health, et cetera? And if so, who would be a good contact at Anchor to discuss this with? Yeah, so we actually have a full uh, case management program. Uh, we have two contacts, uh, Caroline Chadwick and Ebony Gordon, and we can shoot some of those contacts probably into the chat. Um, if Michael doesn't mind doing that, we can shoot some of that information over, but we do, we connect our uh, patients to resources. Uh, specifically, we try to screen everybody that we connect our patients to. So uh, we do, um, yeah. Yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Our social workers also worked on this um, website project, which is still kind of his infancy. You just muted yourself, yeah. I'm trying to press enter to send, but there we go. Um, so Caroline Chadwick, our social worker, put together this website. It's still like being built, um, but it lists um, specifically Connecticut providers. Um, and there's a like a mental health specific area listing therapists and support groups. And, um, you know, and some of these therapists in their profiles list um, trauma-informed care and other trauma-related expertise. And so that's a, a great way to either share those resources with clients, or if you are a provider who thinks you should be on this, like, please let us know, because um, we're trying to build that up. Or by we, I mean Carol. And those are, are those all um, providers that, as, as Dr. Eckert was just saying, you all have sort of screened to make sure these are folks that are, uh, know how to work with the queer community and are providing really good competent services. Yeah, and we always tell our patients if uh, if you have any feedback for us, um, you know, let us know if you're comfortable sharing that, um, and we we will take people off the list if they've had an uncomfortable experience, or add to the list if they had a great experience. So we we do we go through and we we screen and we call and we make sure we're sending our folks to the right places. That's great. All right. Well, I think we're about ready to wrap up here, folks. Um, thank you to folks in the audience for such thoughtful questions. Um, I want to just put in the chat here some information about how you could get connected with, with Anchor Health. If you're here today, it's likely because you are already connected with the Alliance, um, but we can put our social media and stuff in there too in case folks don't have it. Um, I happen to know folks speak very highly and I can testify that the, the Anchor Health TikTok account is wonderful. Um, the, we at the Alliance do not currently use TikTok, so I have a, some jealousy of the, the, the resources and the talent you all are putting into that. It's amazing. Um, they have a YouTube channel, YouTube account, um, and lots of other ways that you could get in touch with them. Um, does anybody from the Alliance want to put, I don't want to get it wrong, Our I think our Instagram handle is really the best way to get a hold of it, I'm I'm just looking it up really quickly so I don't put the thing in the wrong place. Um, we also have an evaluation for today, so I'm gonna 
just drop that in the chat quickly. I will send all of the links and things that have been in the chat today. I will send in a follow up email. I know folks have shared lots of good resources and um, stuff like that. So you'll get all of that. If you have a second to complete an evaluation for us, please do. And I just want to thank all of our panelists today. Thank you, Dr. Eckert, Dr. Canary. Thank you, Bridget, for giving us part of your afternoon and for being just such wonderful examples of what trauma-informed, uh, really culturally specific care looks like. Um, I think all of us probably learned quite a bit today from all of you and, and how we could try to mirror this in our own interactions with folks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much. Thanks for all the work all of you do. Thank you.